Yes, uh, thanks for staying here, uh, my hand-picked audience uh, this late evening. So, um, I call this talk Understanding the Container Revolution, and uh, obviously it didn't scare you off completely. Originally, um, probably the, the better title would have been getting a rough idea about understanding um, what the container revolution could mean for you, you, uh, your colleagues and your projects, but that was a bit too bulky for uh, the call for papers tool. So, um, yeah, I am Robert, by the way, uh, Robert Lemke from Flow Native, and we are a little company um, doing consultancy uh, for some open source uh, content management system called NEOS. Uh, just out of interest, uh, who knows NEOS? Yay! So you, you are here at the conference more frequently, that's very nice. Um, but th how does that make me some kind of cloud expert? Well, um, during the last two and a half years, I've been uh, working on a platform as a service for NEOS, which is not launched yet, uh, so this is kind of a secret. Um, but still, if you're interested, you can uh, ask me all about it. But that's the reason why I dealt a lot with containers and what you need to do with containers to get everything nicely running. So. I am not uh, affiliated with any of the companies I'm going to mention or the projects or whatever. I'm just a container user. Um, but I'm so passionate about this topic and about the impact I think it will have that uh, I decide to, to give this talk to you. All right, so before I start, um, I'd like to uh, ask you just very few questions and some um, non-artificial intelligence will uh, form through some non-automatic process, some modification of my talk to tailor it directly to you. So, uh, who is using Docker already for development? Kind of, okay. And uh, in production, so running your application or web server or service, oh, wow, awesome. And I won't ask about the, the FTP question, but yeah, we'll get into that. Let's start with a very brief history about containerization. Um, not just because, um, you know, when you talk about containers, you look it up and then talk about the history, but because there is really some parallel to what is currently happening with containers in software. So while we look at it, try to keep in mind, like, or try to imagine uh, how the parallel could be to software. So in your company, in your project, is there any parallel? So it all started, um, like, before or during uh, World War II, people were still shipping goods uh, with something called uh, break bulk shipping. So they were have all kinds of mixed cargo they had to load and unload to ships. And of course, that took quite some time um, to, to prepare, and they needed warehouses and everything. So they were always looking for some more efficient way to load their cargo, but also to transport it to the ships and from the ships. And then in uh, around the 1930s, um, the first containers came up, which were basically boxes um, or even steel boxes of some sort, but there were no real standards. So imagine you're a big company, you need to transport stuff, then your company would build these containers and make sure that they can be loaded on, on your um, train uh, vehicles and so on. So, but the important bit was um, the standardization of containers. And that happened in 1968, uh, when there was the first ISO standard for, which described the dimensions and the, the weight classes for containers. So this is a 20-foot equivalent unit container, um, and that is also how cargo is measured. Um, and that made a huge impact because when you standardize how containers look like and where holes are and how it is fixed and everything, um, you can create um, specific vehicles and purpose-built uh, ships and other infrastructure for these containers. So you can imagine that for a company, shipping goods, that means 
uh, that you don't have to take care about the whole shipping like from end to end, but you can work with different companies and it's much more easy to transport your goods. Anyway, it also had some, some, some unexpected um, benefits. For example, the reliability of shipping goods was much better than before. So um, manufacturing could actually do just-in-time manufacturing. They could count on certain goods to arrive at a certain point because everything was much more streamlined. Um, and also the losses of goods uh, due to theft and so on um, declined a lot because goods were not visible from outside anymore. So for whoever um, sh was shipping containers, um, they didn't know if there was something valuable or not inside these containers. I don't know if you found a few parallels already, like this could be about security in software containers. Um, but also around the actual shipping, some, some further industries evolved um, for example, there's a whole industry about repositioning empty containers um, because uh, where full containers are unloaded, they, um, they usually don't need empty containers in the same amount. And certainly also for the people working in the whole industry, shipping industry, this ch changed dramatically over only very few years. So 19 out of 20 longshoremen were unnecessary uh, when con containerization um, uh, got, got its impact. It also had some, some quite some impact on uh, semi-skilled or skilled people, uh, labor, craft, who only were specialized on very specific things, uh, very specific tasks uh, during shipment. Okay, now finally, uh, about containers and software. So, the original motivation probably for containers and software is um, to, to find a lightweight uh, weight, way to, to run software, um, isolate multiple applications um, and resources on the same machine. So that, that is something you could probably, uh, you probably already know. <laughs> um, so, but containers don't try to simulate a whole computer. When you compare it with um, whole system virtualizers, um, they try to really simulate um, a graphics card and um, sound device and network and all that. Um, and containers don't try to do that. They just um, uh, separate and isolate processes and resources. So you know that applications um, are running as a process or certain several processes and there's some CPU and kernel who takes care of um, these processes and containers are just a way uh, that these processes can see each other. So the, the basic infrastructure and um, uh, basic system is the same of course for virtualized machines um, and containers but on top of that, um, when, when you uh, use Docker, for example, you have your containers and not your virtual machines, and they live side by side um, and share the same host OS. So actually, they are really accessing um, the same kernel and the same machine. They just don't see each other. So the first container-ish technology probably was the change route environment and later on the jail um, environment. By the way, that's where the, uh, the name jailbreak comes from. And uh, ChangeRoot was, uh, I think, developed in 1979 uh, already, so it's quite old. Um, and uh, I think FreeBSD in, introduced jail like in the in year 2000 or so. Um, but the capabilities of that technology was not comparable to what you currently have with containers. Um, and the important bit really was uh, the introduction of Linux namespaces. Namespaces in Linux are basically exactly um, doing what I, what I just said, that they um, isolate these processes and don't let you see the other processes. 
The most important bit of it is called uh, um, user namespace. So you don't see the other processes, the other um, user processes. And another one is called the control group, uh, which allows you to limit and, and um, deal with uh, the resources one container needs. So for example, how much CPU memory and so on. LXC, Linux containers, um, was initially released in 2008, was taking advantage of these namespaces, um, but was not so popular as, as Docker today. Um, and there's a big reason for that. So Docker is, of course, a container technology um, like LXC. And actually, you can even use LX, uh, Linux containers um, below Docker as some, some engine. But um, Docker was so successful because it provided some abstraction on a higher level. It defined um, additional tooling, an image format, actually how you can uh, basically package your, your application and uh, upload it to some registry, download it from some registry. Um, and it also provided some domain-specific language to build these images and lots of many things uh, more. And that made it so successful because um, um, because of this image format and, and the different tooling uh, which was uh, involved. So Docker is much more than just starting or stopping uh, a container. But I think most of us or many people are using Docker as a better virtual machine. Because, I mean, a virtual machine has some drawbacks, as you can imagine. Um, when you use it for development, you uh, might have some, some virtual uh, VMware or virtual box running on your development machine, have some base image using Vagrant and so on. Um, and whenever that changes, or if you ever have to switch between projects with different um, environments, that is quite bulky. So Docker does have some advantage there because it's much more lightweight. But still, that is not the revolutionary part. And also, it has been quite hard. So who started using Docker but doesn't use Docker anymore? And yeah, I, I met quite a few actually uh, who, who started introducing Docker and uh, awesome container uh, virtualization and, and then were completely disappointed. The problem in the, in the first, like in the last two years was um, that everything was developing so fast and um, you could upgrade uh, to a new Docker version and everything was broken and you had to be very, very careful to have certain Linux kernel patches applied. And, um, and also the whole tool set for, um, for providing or deploying Docker containers in production was just missing. Um, so sorry for, that I ask you so many questions, but that keeps your arms moving. Um, those of you who use Docker in production, um, who cre created his own scripts or way of deployment? Oh, that's very much fewer than I thought, like, like only four or five or so. And two years ago, there wouldn't have been another way to do it, right? The only way to get some Docker um, container running in production is to either log into the machine and type docker run or do some scripting. And also the docker company um, had a lot of issues. Um, it wasn't clear really what is the business model um, behind that company? What, what do they want to earn their money with? Um, is it a true open source project where everyone can, um, can join and contribute? And that was quite a difficult um, situation and phase. And when you rely on, on something like Docker, which is so prominent, you really want to be sure that it also exists in five or 10 or 15 years. So in the meantime, um, there have been something called container wars. Even I wouldn't call it like that, but that was really the, the term. 
Um, and one result of it was that um, eventually Docker released parts of the Docker technology as standalone open source projects. For example, ContainerD um, was recently released. <clears throat> and that allows others who want to develop container solutions uh, similar to Docker, like with some API on top and so on, to use the same um, low-level container technology below. And that's a very good step, but it came very, very late and almost too late. So I, that means Docker, I'm, I'm mentioning Docker all the time, but there are, of course, other um, uh, container solutions like Rocket from CoreOS, for example, at the moment. And I'm not sure if in five or ten years from now, Docker will be still the most used container um, engine or not. But I think it's not really important, because that still isn't the revolutionary part. So if you have a container stack, that's all cool, but after all, it's just a stack of containers. Um, and like I said, you still have the challenge. How do you deploy your application? How do you uh, manage it in production? And that's still not very easy. You can do lots of nice things with container stacks, but it doesn't solve your original problem. And <laughs> funnily, developers often forget about the original problem, um, like earning money. <laughs> um, so, but basically, it's about delivering software. And in these times, um, you can't afford to say, OK, we release a new software every year. You know, we send out CD-ROMs by snail mail uh, with our latest software version. Of course, you have to release much more often. Um, and that could mean several times a day, because your competition, competition also does that. Um, if they are clever enough. And for, the, for that, you need low-risk releases. You need to really be confident about your release pipeline. Um, and you want to provide still the same high quality um, and not have lots of new QA um, people and, and uh, sysadmins to do all the releases a day. So remember these times? Launching a website meant go buy a server, install the operating system, go to the data center. Who did that? <laughs> yes. And actually, it was quite fun, I think, you know, sometimes. Um, when you do it once or twice, <laughs> but 100 times. Well, um, and of course, deployments you still can deploy with FTP and <clears throat> just test it on your production server. Other companies are doing that, obviously, as well. Um, but still, it's a lot of work. It doesn't really scale, because if you have a sysadmin, um, he can probably take care of five uh, servers, or 10 or 15, but not about 5,000 or so. Um, and it's, it's, of course, error-prone. Um, you don't really want to do that. That's probably all no big news, but um, because you know the history uh, which, which came out of that, that is, we try to normalize things. So we try to introduce conventions, processes, um, base images for virtual machines, and eventually configuration management, like Puppet, Chef, Ansible, or may I ask you again, who's using any of uh, Puppet, Chef, Ansible, some configuration management? Okay. I also did. Um, and when you have that, I mean, what you try to do is normalize your environment. You, you create some Ansible script or some Chef um, uh, file to, to make sure that you can reproduce servers. You have the same environment all the time. And then you automate it. You create some Jenkins job or some GitLab CI job, which can uh, provision a new server, uh, which can deploy something. Because ultimately, uh, your goal is to, to do continuous delivery. So when you want to see, um, have an idea about a new feature or product, 
um, then you want to ship updates as soon as possible. So uh, who is doing Scrum or any other agile development in this company? Wow, very nice. Who does continuous delivery? And that should actually be exactly the same, but it's not. So what, what do you do with a product after each sprint if you don't continuously deliver, right? Um, anyway, it should be, <laughs> should be the case. So how do com containers uh, come into play there? So one thing is hands off your servers. If you need to log into your server um, in order to scale or deploy or whatever, something is wrong with your automation. Um, and one puzzle in that game was the idea of infrastructure as code. So saying, OK, your infrastructure like servers and network and fire, firewall and everything, I describe that with configuration management or some other tools, um, and I can put it into Git and have my software best practices um, to run that. Still, it might be a good idea, but um, what sucks about configuration management is more the organizational problem. Like, if you have a company with different departments, product development op operations, who owns these configuration management scripts? Neither case is a good solution. And that is probably how DevOps evolved, which is a bit of uh, a big compromise and um, still not the solution. Um, and the server which you brought to your data center and gave it names and, you know, uh, cherished and you wondered how it, f how it feels, if it's healthy and so on, um, that also doesn't work in the long run. So Werner Vogel said, I've hugged servers enough in my life and they do not hug you back, they hate you. But did you notice that this is all about infrastructure and not about your application, which was the original goal, right? Shipping uh, your application. You only dealt with infrastructure, and certainly it helped a bit. So again, a container stack by itself is just a stack of containers. Um, and if you want to look at how containers could work, like uh, at scale or even not at scale, um, then certainly you need to look at Google because they are doing that for 17 years now with a software called Borg. And that is the missing piece in the puzzle, really, um, because um, they created an API which is centered around the application, not the infrastructure. So you don't say, I run a new server or I create a new network interface or whatever. Um, this is all about around the containers and, and um, the actual application. So logs are grouped by applications, uh, not machines. They have load balancing, which load balance traffic for instances of your application, not servers. Um, and you might think like, OK, yeah, so is that such a big difference? But it's a whole different mindset. And also. Um, it means something for the developers. Um, out of Borg actually evolved some open source project um, called Kubernetes. And honestly, that contains the wisdom of the 17 years um, put into a fresh open source project. Even though it's really young, um, there are, there's so much experience in it. Um, and it can do all kinds of amazing things. So, for example, it schedules your containers. So let's say you have 20 machines to start with, and Kubernetes will figure out, depending on the resources you need for that little application, where should I put it? And if some machine dies, it will relocate your container and make sure that the traffic is relocated. It will make sure that there's a hard disk which can be mounted to your um, container, it can horizontally scale your containers depending on metrics you provide. And actually there is, there is uh, a whole conversation between this orchestrator and your container. It's not a one-way um, automation. 
So I think really, and not because I think it, many people think that Kubernetes will become for cloud hosting what Linux is for servers right now. And there are many reasons to, to think that. Also because it's, a, uh, it's the most active um, open source project on GitHub, by the way. And it's a beautiful piece of software. So we know that breakbox shipping didn't scale. So I think um, also in, in a way it doesn't scale for, for our software. And yeah, <laughs> I don't know. I think that our, our jobs, not only our jobs as developers or as product teams, but also for everyone in this business can change a lot. If you think about, you have, I mean, for example, at Google, they don't have a department called operations anymore. They, they approach it completely different. They don't have people, um, system administrators, uh, watching the servers and how they deal like, and product development teams on the other hand, because they have completely conflicting on interests, right? The sysadmins try to keep everything as it is, as stable as it can, and the product development team try to change everything as fast as possible. So how can they ever be happy together? I mean, DevOps was just a compromise. So what they call it is um, service, uh, site reliability engineers, and they actually look at the infrastructure from the point of view of a developer. They try to automate everything. There's a really cool book uh, from O'Reilly about it. I can recommend. So I think that containers can make the process of delivering software more efficient. I mean, the time uh, is not enough for this talk to, to really convince you, I guess, so I need to do that more often. Um, but also containers uh, and orchestration only make sense uh, at a certain scale. So, I mean, I know developers who want to go from here to Wannsee, I uh, think like that's a long way to walk. I first build a train station and then let's see. Um, but if you only have one machine or two, it doesn't make sense. But it starts at three, three ticks and you refactor, right? Um, and remember that without orchestration, container is just a box. It's, it's a nice way to virtualize things, but the real interesting magic happens when you try to orchestrate it. Um, it will take quite some years to get into it, also because of the cultural shift. Departments don't match anymore. Teams are, I mean, people won't like it, really. <laughs> Most people in an organization won't like it. Um, but after all, uh, you have a lot of time, so I guess in 100 years still we'll uh, deploy websites and, and applications with FTP. So finally, um, I think container orchestration will change the way you think about software architecture, microservices, event-driven, think all that. Operations, deployment, monitoring, debugging, this all is completely different but it's very, very exciting. And self-healing clusters are just the best gift you have uh, when you're on call and need to check uh, if, if something's going wrong, because uh, that is then something you do at 9 o'clock in the morning over a coffee and see what happened last night. So, thanks.